everybody. It's Monday, October 3rd. That means it's time for another episode of Nonprofit Conversations. I'm your host, Cecilia Sop. I'm a certified association executive, and I am the principal and founder of Rogue Tulips Consulting. Thanks for joining us for this week's episode, and I would like to send out a special good morning, good afternoon, or good evening to our global audience, and welcome. We're really excited this week because we have one of our favorite returning guests, Ed Barks, who's a communications expert, and he's going to talk with us today about online conversations and how to best prepare and facilitate them. Welcome back, Ed. Would you like to say hello and tell our audience a little about yourself? Yeah, thanks so much, Cecilia. Great to be back with you again. Uh, yeah, I am a communication strategy consultant and a training consultant and a business author. So I write books for communications and government relations executives who need to get themselves and need to get their spokespeople up to speed when they're dealing with the public. Uh, it may be through a presentation, it may be through a media interview, even congressional testimony. But that's where I tend to come into play, when they need to get their message squared away and understand how to deliver it. That is really a great point, too, about congressional testimony. Uh, Ed and I are both in the greater D.C. area, so that is something that's on people's minds quite a lot here. I don't think people realize how much prep goes into that as well as our daily communications. And as we all know, since the uh, lockdown related to the global pandemic of 2020-2021, many of us were forced into the online world of communication and facilitation and online meetings. And some of us, like myself, who were already working virtually, didn't think it was that big a deal. But there was a challenge for those people who were used to going to the office or having those in-person meetings. But Ed, what is really different about an online meeting or conversation or facilitation versus an in-person one? One thing, and one thing only, this, this usually shocks people when they hear me say this, it's just the technology. It's just a different set of tools that you have to work with. So you still need to go through the same type of preparation when you're moderating a conversation online. It may be a, a meeting, let's say a committee meeting of some sort or a work internally related meeting, uh, could be a webinar of sorts, but no matter what you're moderating, you still need to take almost precisely the same steps you need to take if you were doing it within a physical room. In other words, you need to get to know the panelists and, and introduce them to one another. You need to get their bios so we can introduce them to those who are listening. So th there's a lot of steps you need to take and we can go into some of those in greater depth if you like. But the fact is it's just the technology that's changed. You know, I am so glad you said that because as somebody who had a paid Zoom account years before the lockdown, <laughs> I can tell you, uh, that's really, to me, the the big difference is I am still amazed by the fact that here in the 21st century, we can have real-time conversations with people anywhere in the world, whether we're recording them or not, uh, but we can just talk to anyone anytime. And kind of a funny uh, thing that I realized many years ago, I started my career at the U.S. Chamber of Commerce and we faxed everything back then. Um, it was the Reagan era. Uh, so we used fax machines and we would fax things. One day I was faxing something to Australia and it struck me that on the other side of the world, a piece of paper was coming out another machine just a few minutes later with that on there. And, and so that was really an eye opener for me about how technology enhances our communication ability. It allows people to participate more and from farther away, or people can come to a uh, virtual annual conference that may not be able to come in person for whatever reason, um, time or money constraints. So uh, I think that technology part is uh, important. And I do want to go into some depth on the other points. But before we get off technology, Ed, do you have any tips for people running an online meeting or facilitation or conversation about getting comfortable with the technology? Well, it involves practice, and that, that should be part of anybody's preparation steps, no matter what you're doing when you communicate. And in this case, if you're moderating an online type of meeting or conversation, you need to practice with the technology you're actually going to use. And for instance, I use Zoom a lot. That's kind of my platform of choice. If a client at some point asks me to do something on Microsoft Teams or on Skype, I, 
I'm going to need to do a little more, a little bit more extra preparation because I'm just not used to working with those tools as much as I am with Zoom. So it's all about the practice ahead of time. It, it, it's getting as much confusion out of your mind and out of your way as you can. I think that's an excellent point, especially since so many of us uh, started using Zoom in the lockdown years because Zoom is always adding additional tools. They're adding uh, add-ons, they have integrations now. Uh, sometimes th they update the software so often in a six week period, you start getting glitches. Uh, so you need to be aware of some of these things. Uh, also, I'm with you on Microsoft Teams. I don't use that as often at all. I'm also a Zoom person, uh, but that that does work very differently as does google meet google meet is very different from teams and zoom uh so i i agree with you on that it, it's very similar to making sure you know what av is going to be available in an in-person meeting and running through your presentation and making sure you're ready to go so now that we've got the technology out of the way uh what are some other tips for just successful management of conversations and meetings and facilitation that we should all be aware of? Well, again, I'll come back to preparation. And I know in many cases with my clients, I sound like a broken record when I talk about that, but that is really so vital. And, and I've already talked about you know, getting an understanding of who the panelists are and how you can introduce them. There are other steps you have to take too. For example, if you are moderating a meeting and it's an online meeting, you had best log on to that platform at least 30 minutes ahead of time. So that if there are any issues, any problems, you, you hopefully be able to troubleshoot them or at least give yourself a fighting chance at, at resolving whatever the problem is. Also, if let's say you have, you're moderating a panel discussion online, invite the participants in about maybe 20 minutes ahead of time so that they can also troubleshoot anything that may come up. You'll have a sense of what's going on. And, and if, again, if there's anything you need to iron out, you've given yourself 20 minutes or so to do that. Now, the other point is do not let the crowd into the room until the appointed hour. Now, I, I've, I've done presentations where, you know, we're, we're, I'm talking with a moderator behind the scenes, I thought, and all of a sudden people started popping into the, the screen. And my thought was, well, the, you know, did, are, are we letting everybody in? And the moderator says, well, yeah, I'm just kind of letting them in as they come. Please, let, don't, people don't need to see what's going on backstage. <laughs> so, so, you know, let the people in at the appointed hour. And one more point about that appointed hour, mm -hmm. start on time. Please, I'm begging you, yes. if you ever moderate a meeting, start on time. And I don't mean as we, many of us, probably most of us have heard at one point or another, or, or many more than many more times than once, is let's just give people a few more minutes to log in and, and get ready. Nope, no, 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 no. If the start time is let's say 10 o'clock, then if, if you can't figure out how to get in your seat and, and behind your camera by 10 o'clock, that's on you. Right. So you never want to punish those who are arriving on time. I am so glad you said that because that is how I run meetings as well. I, I do not start later than one minute past the start time. And that is because I do respect the fact that the other people are here on time or maybe showed up a few minutes early to make sure they were on time. So if it's a webinar or one of the courses that I lead or study group, we start on time because it, most of the people are there. And, and even if you're, you're just an, an attendee, you know, even if it's not a participatory type of webinar, get, please, I'm begging you, get there five minutes ahead of time so that you can, again, get everything squared away. You know what's what, you, you understand how to ask questions. And then when the proceedings start on the dot, not mm -hmm. a minute after, not two minutes, three minutes after giving people time, then you're ready to go. And I think that's really important, too, because I think not just the presenter or the meeting leader has a responsibility, but the people participating in the meeting have a responsibility as well. And we all have very full schedules and we all understand that. So uh, we need to plan around that. I, I really am a fan of you saying preparation, 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 because that is a big thing I do in, in all aspects of my life. I'm always looking ahead. I'm planning. I'm 
I, before I get in the car, I know which route I'm going to take <laughs> to wherever I'm going. Uh, so I've already got that decided. So I'm, and my, my uh, great late father-in-law, John Sub, taught me a great saying, prior preparation prevents poor performance. And that was something he used throughout his career. So I think uh, that pretty much sums up uh, how you can do well in anything. Uh, so what are some other things? So we've talked about being on time. We've talked about getting to know the technology if we're doing an online meeting. Uh, what about practicing with all the panelists before you do a presentation? Yeah, that's certainly an option. And I think uh, the clear answer there is it depends. Mm -hmm. Depends on the topic, depends how often these panelists have discussed it, how steeped they are in, in number one, the topic, and number two, dealing with a panel situation where they have to share the mic quite, quite literally in this case. <laughs> so you know, I, I would certainly suggest some kind of gathering with the moderator and the panel participants ahead of time. How formal, whether it needs to be a formal practice, Maybe, maybe not. That's something you need to engage on a case-by-case -case basis, but do have some kind of session so the panelists get to know one another. They get at least some degree of, one would hope, a comfort level with each other. Mm -hmm. Now, if the meeting has been set up and the program has been set up so sparks are intended to fly, well, okay, you know, there, there may be some sparks in that prep meeting as well. At least then you'll know what the dynamics are going to look like when the real thing uh, crops up. Wow. Well, that definitely makes things more interesting <laughs> when there's sparks flying and people disagreeing. Uh, but well, there's actually a great follow-up question to that, Ed. So let's say you're the moderator and you've, you've maybe practiced with the panelists, but then like some serious sparks start flying during the actual presentation with the attendees. What, do you have any suggestions for techniques that people could use to manage that? Because that could quickly spiral out of control. Yeah, yeah. And there are certainly some techniques you can use. And the moderator really has to step in if things are starting to get a little too heated and a little too out of control. The, the best attitude a moderator can take is to remember that they are not there to espouse a position. They are there to make sure a uh, either an informational dialogue or a persuasive dialogue, whatever the case may be, that they will do their best to make that happen. Mm -hmm. So they have to be you know, kind of the Switzerland of people up there on the on the the dais, be that in person or be it remote. Uh, so it's a matter of you know trying to uh, insert yourself when need be as the moderator. And, you know, it may be something as, as almost inane as, okay, you know, I think we've covered this issue sufficiently. You, you can certainly talk with our panelists about it afterward, if you like, or contact them afterward. Let's move on to the next question, which is. And I think that is a great way to handle that, <laughs> because sometimes you just have to diffuse that energy and then maybe, or send it in a different direction. Uh, and sometimes so that, if, if that energy comes from a, a question and, and if you open the mics and cameras and let people pose questions verbally as opposed to in the chat function, mm -hmm. then sometimes people will, and again, we've all seen this, they will start on a diatribe and, and there won't really be a question there. And at that point, the moderator needs to step in and, and really try to narrow down your question, please. Or if it, it just gets to, to this, this type of you know, diatribe where it's, it's totally non-productive, a quick thank you, insert yourself into the conversation as the moderator. And then remember too, that as the moderator or the person, the technology person working with you, you have the ability to mute participants. <laughs> And I, I would not take that lightly because, uh, and again, I, we've all been in situations where you're, you're in this meeting and the speaker is, is giving a presentation and all of a sudden you hear a sneeze or a bird chirping or a doorbell or something and, and somebody has left their mic open. They don't understand or forgot to mute. Mm -hmm. If that's the case, you know, I, I don't even bother anymore with saying, would everyone please mute yourself? I'll just go into the participant list and click mute, 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 whoever it is, because you, you don't want those distractions out of respect for everybody else who's in attendance. I, you know, I agree with that. I'm just kind of laughing because uh, right before you said hit that mute button, I was thinking the same thing uh, because sometimes people, they they don't realize how long they're talking 
and and they'll go on and on and it turns into a wall a wall of words basically uh because you can't get you cannot insert yourself politely to say well thank you uh, let's let somebody else talk and that uh they can be a challenge with with podcast guests not you <laughs> but uh you know sometimes somebody is nervous and and they they talk for like seven eight minutes and that can be a little hard to manage because you don't want to be rude to a guest. You want to let them have their say. But when I, when we're in a meeting or a webinar or a facilitation, we do have to be aware of the time factor for everyone else too. That that people are there for certain a certain uh, meeting topic or webinar learning, and so we have to be able to be fair with people. But I also kind of laughing because sometimes in life I wish there was a mute button. <laughs> 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 when you're talking to people, <laughs> uh, like, okay, asked and answered counselor. <laughs> so, um, and it, it also reminded me of our earlier comment about testifying before Congress, because if somebody is violating the rules of engagement uh, in the House of Representatives, they are presented with the gavel. Mm -hmm. uh, yep. and, and they're that that's the sign. Okay, you've gone too far. Or the mace, I'm sorry, they present the mace. Uh, which not like mace that you squirt at people, but like a mace is, is something like a hammer or a weapon kind of, but they present the mace so that the person realizes, oh, okay, I've really gone too far off the rules here and need to come back. So th those are all really great tips because uh, bringing it back to your original statements, Ed, it really is about being prepared, understanding who your audience is going to be, how much time you have, and then the technology of what you're using for the online meeting and facilitation. So before we wrap up, are, are there any other things that we haven't touched on that you think people should know about, you know, facilitating an online conversation or, or a meeting? Well, you mentioned time limits, and that's a crucial one for any moderator of any discussion. If, for instance, again, it's a panel discussion, and you've all agreed that the panelists will have five minutes each to deliver some opening remarks, and then you'll go into Q&A. Uh, sometimes panelists tend to get a little lengthy with their remarks mm -hmm. and they haven't practiced them probably so that they think, well, this will take me five minutes and 10 minutes later, they're, they're still chugging along. <laughs> so as the moderator, you need to step in and, and enforce the agreed upon guidelines for their out of respect for the other panelists and for the audience too. Also at the end of the session end on time as well. If you've agreed on a one hour session, you know, at 58 minutes, start wrapping it up mm -hmm. so that th that time element is very important from a moderator's perspective too. And it's part of your, part of what you've agreed to do as moderator. Well, and I think most people who are coming to an online meeting of any kind, whether it's education or a committee meeting, we are all professionals and we are all grownups. And so I think if we make it very clear from the beginning, we're starting and ending on time, we'll start our wrap up at a certain point. I think we can all uh, understand that and get with that agenda. So those are, well, and unfortunately though, we are uh, near the end of our episode. And uh, before we wrap up, I wanna thank Ed for joining us again and sharing his wisdom. Uh, he's one of our favorite guests. So we look forward to having him back next year. Uh, so, Ed, as you know, we always like to ask our guest, uh, what is the one thought you'd like the audience to take away today? And then how could they get in touch with you if they wanted to talk more? Well, I'm going to pull out the hammer again. It's preparation. <laughs> it's preparation. You've got to decide with forethought how you're going to handle your moderator's duties, what you need to do to make a successful program or meeting for the rest of the participants, because that's on you as the moderator. And in terms of getting in touch, I will mention that, that there are a number of uh, pieces in my latest book, Insider Strategies for the Competent Communicator, uh, that speak directly to moderating panels and to moderating online discussions as well. Um, the good news there is that the, uh, the book is available uh, with my compliments. This is something I decided to do earlier this year as we were kind of in fits and starts coming out of the pandemic, and I know we're not there yet. Nonetheless, it, it's it's a kind of a way to give back, if you will. And to get the lowdown on that, simply go to uh, www.barkscom.com. That's spelled B-A-R-K-S-C-O-M-M.com slash insider book. 
Oh, I think that's just wonderful that you created that tool and are just sharing it with the world. And uh, I will say, and, and this is as an author, I, I've written four books now. And as an author, it, it frosts me to no end when people say, I've got a, a, an ebook. And you look at the book and it's like 15, 20 pages. Yeah. And, uh, fo- th- th- folks, this is a book. <laughs> <laughs> this is an actual book. It's more than 20 pages long. And it's not a list of bullet points. Uh, that's, you know, it's so funny, Ed, you and I have so many of the same pet peeves. Uh, because that's, <laughs> that is uh, one of mine as well. Because uh, to me, that's a pamphlet or yeah. a handout, an essay, maybe. Uh, I would never call a 15 page thing a book. Um, and then there's people who don't even write a whole paragraph. They write lists of bullet points and then say it's a book. That's not a book. Mm-hmm. Being a writer is a different level. Uh, to be a real author like you are, uh, I am a writer. I have not published a book yet. That's on my bucket list mm-hmm. eventually. Um, but yeah, to be a writer is is to put a lot of thought and effort and time and, and, and a dense amount of information together for your audience. And knowing the quality of your book said, I, I understand how much time and energy you invested in this book that you are now sharing with the world. And so I hope a lot of people come in and get your book and learn from it. Because that's great. And I'm going to stop now because otherwise I'll start talking about how much I don't like calliope music or clowns because that's the other thing on my pet peeve list. So, well, Ed, thanks again for joining us. And I, I do encourage the audience, wherever you are in the world, go to Ed's website, barkscom.com and look at his book. Uh, he also has some other books you may find of interest as well. We have to go rogue for now. Thanks for joining us this week. And If you'd like to learn more about Rogue Tulips Consulting and how we can help your organization bloom outside the box, visit our website, roguetulips.com. We have uh, information about our services as well as our weekly blog that you might find of interest. If you are a current CAE or a CAE candidate looking for courses or education to support your application or to uh, support your renewal, check out our education program, uh, the 501c League. You can learn more about that at the 501cleague.net. Thanks again, everyone. And on behalf of myself and Ed, thanks for joining us. And we'll be back next time with another exciting episode. <laughs>